I do want to say just thank you for having me today. Um, I am going to share some scripture and share what about really the strategy of what we're doing. But I want to share some scripture this morning and challenge you. And then I want to share with you about Cleveland. And Cleveland, Ohio is a place that is in need of the gospel, just like Knoxville or Alcoy, Tennessee. And so uh, I want to share with you how God drew me there and how God's drawn me there and, and what's going on. Um, I tell people I'm a Southern Baptist nine months before I was born. Um, our dad, my, some of my, my family's here, my sisters are here today. Uh, my dad was a deacon in the church uh, that we grew up in over towards Hardin Valley. And I, uh, you just know where Hardin Valley is? It's not the same Hardin Valley that I grew up in. It's changed. The developers have changed the landscape of that place. And so I tell people, I was, I was Southern Baptist. I, I learned about missions and royal ambassadors when I was a little boy in, as, in RAs. And learned about missions, and, and, and in my heart, somehow I knew that God would have me in missions. And then when I got married, my wife, we became, I became an RA leader. My wife became an ACT team leader and uh, taught GAs, and, and God had a plan for us, just like God has a plan for you. But God is ascending God, and that's why I want to speak to you about this morning, that God, we, we serve a God who's ascending God, but the problem is today that he has ascending people. Would you agree with me? You see, we come to church, and we want to have all of our needs met, and we set soak and sour. You know what really what happens when you set soak and sour? You become a pickle, because that's what pickles do. They, so somebody, you're sitting here, and you're a bunch of pickles. But God is ascending God, but we have become a sitting people. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 12 this morning, and I want to read to you just the calling of Abraham. At this time, he's known as Abram. My hotel car just fell. And um, I want to read to you this scripture as well as Isaiah and as well as a scripture in John. In Genesis chapter 12, notice what the scripture says. And the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred in your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless uh, you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old. Now, there's a scripture in the, in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has this heavenly vision. And in this heavenly vision, he, he sees an angel that comes to him. And he, and he starts t confessing his sins. And the angel takes a coal from the altar in heaven and places it upon his lips. And Isaiah says, woe is me, I am a, a man of unclean lips. And God asks the question, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says what? Here am I, Lord, send me. And in the next verse, in verse 8, God says, go. And then in, G, in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says this. He says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. God is a missionary God. He is a sending God. Now, as Southern Baptists, I'm just going to rag on us for a little while. We have become too comfortable giving to Lottie and Annie and the Golden State offering. We, we have become too comfortable in just giving offerings and think that satisfies our duty to go and be sent. But the fact of the matter is, dear church, you are a sent people. First of all, you are sent to the people in this neighborhood. This neighborhood is your mission field. God has called you to reach the people in, around this community and in Alcoa. God has called you to reach your family. God has called you to reach those that you go to school with. He has placed in front of you people that you work with. God has sent you to reach those people. Let me ask you a simple question. I want you to be honest. Outside of your family and outside of the church, how many people has, have, 
ever share the gospel with you. Be honest. How many people outside of your family and outside of the church ever shared the gospel with you? Anybody want to share? How, many, be honest, how about you, man? How many people before, before you were saved shared the gospel with you that weren't in your family or, or in the church? Two. It's going to be a minimal number. It's going to be zero, one, or two. Now think about all the people that are part of your life. Think about the people that, that, you, that maybe cuts your hair or does your hair. Think about the people who mow, maybe mows your lawn. Or, or think about the people that you're in contact with every day. How many people do you think are sharing the gospel with them? It's going to be zero or one or two. Now, what connection do we have here? It's simple this, that God has sent you into those people's lives, whether it's in your elementary school, your middle school, your high school, your college, or wherever it is, God has sent you to those people. It is not, they, they didn't send Matt to those people that are in your life. Matt may not know those people you work with. He may not know the people that are in the school. He may not know the person who cuts your hair, but you do. And God is calling you to reach them. You see, dear friend, I have a business card. And on that business card, it has a North American Mission Board with my name. And it says, I am the Cleveland Send City Missionary. But the fact of the matter is, every one of you have a business card that has missionary on it. And some of you have even called out to God and, and, and have said to God, God, I will go where you send me. God, just let me know I will go. And God has told you, some of you, that you need to go, but you're still sitting. God has told some of you to go into your school, but you're not going. Some of you, some of you God has told that he wants you to go and, and start a Bible study in your neighborhood, but you're not going. You're still sitting. God is ascending God, but we have become a sitting people. And that is a sin, dear friend. God is calling us to go. Matt read the scripture this morning. Go. Are we a going people? We say, well, we have missionaries that do that. Dear friend, I cannot do what I do without you. I cannot do what I do without your prayers, without your support. God has sent me to Cleveland, Ohio, a place where that is known as Mistake on the Lake, a place where there are about 2 million people and only 8% evangelical presence. Today, this morning, right now, in Cleveland, Ohio, in a city of about 2 million people, there are only 7,000 Southern Baptists meeting together in churches in Cleveland, Ohio. Think about that. Think about the number of Southern Baptist churches and evangelical churches in Blount County, or where I grew up in Knox County, 154 Southern Baptist churches, one Southern Baptist church for every 1,500 people. We're in Cleveland, there's one Southern Baptist church for every 34,000 people. And so I help plant churches. That's what God called me to do. I've planted two churches in the Cleveland area. And uh, it's kind of interesting to plant a church because I'm glad, Matt, went, you went where you went with this, dude, because you, you gave the history of this church. As you drive around this community, you see churches everywhere. Have you ever thought, how did that church come into being? Now, I joke here and say, you know, in, 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 in the South, you know, here's how they start churches. Somebody at First Baptist Church gets mad, they go off and they start Second Baptist Church. Somebody at Second Baptist Church, they get ticked off and they'll go start Third Baptist Church. Now, that's the farthest I've ever seen it go. I'm not sure there's a fourth. But where I pastored in Anderson County, I was the first, second, third Baptist church. That's because somebody got mad. And so that's not church planting. Church planting. I, 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 I better don't go there. Okay, anyways, uh, I'm going to get people mad at me. Um, we have in Cleveland, I'm going to show you some things. I'm going to show you a video in just a moment. But. In Cleveland, we have Little Italy, we have Asia Town, Slavic Village, Little Ukrainian Village, we have Little Iraq. We have all these different places in Cleveland that are very ethnically diverse. 71% of the people claim Catholicism. We have 300,000 descendants, uh, Italian descendants, 300,000 German descendants, and then everything else mixed in between. Cleveland is the fourth poorest city in America. Fourth, poor, I noticed there's, I should have put the graphic up. We are number five in childhood poverty and number one in adult poverty in Cleveland. I, I got news for you. 
LeBron James is not the king of Cleveland. Jesus is. And while we like LeBron James and we like the Cavs, and matter of fact, they're 10 and 0 in the playoffs, and we're expecting another championship this year, he is not the king. I'm a chaplain with the Indians organization, the Cleveland Indians, and I love the Cleveland Indians, and they were in the World Series last year, but they are not what we're about. But I tell you that to say if you were to go downtown two years ago and you were to ask the average Joe on the street, what is your hope for Cleveland? And this is a true, honest answer. They would say that the Browns would win the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, 1-15 last year. That's going to happen. All right. But that's their hope. The sports teams. And so we won the NBA championship last year. And today, if you were to still walk downtown Cleveland and ask the average person, what is your hope? They would still say that the Browns would win the Super Bowl. They have no hope. <laughs> they false hope. But that just shows you that they, are not, they do not care about spiritual matters. Spiritual matters are the furthest thing from their mind. They do not care. Again, nine out of ten people that you meet in Cleveland do not know Jesus. When I planted a church in the suburbs of Cleveland, we had a vacation Bible school to park. We had a mission team from Mississippi that came up. And we had all these kids. We canvassed the neighborhood. We had all these kids come to vacation Bible school. And like you do usually in vacation Bible school, this was in the park. You know, you have crafts, you have games, uh, you have uh, refreshments, you have the Bible story. And the, and this, 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 uh, the leaders were starting to tell this Bible story. And they were telling the story of Jesus and somebody, I don't know who it was that day, but I was there. I got to hear it. And so they began to talk about, you know, okay, we're going to read from the Bible today a story about Jesus. A little boy about 12 years old raises his hand a little, in a white suburban neighborhood, raises his hand and says, what's a Bible and who is Jesus? Uh, my heart broke because here I am in, North, in the United States in a suburban middle class neighborhood and a little boy about 12 years old had never heard of Jesus, had never, did not know what a Bible was. I want to show you a video of Cleveland that kind of gives a, a kind of a, a look at Cleveland, and I want to share some things about how your church can make an impact in Cleveland. So watch this video. Who do people say we are, huh? Do they say we're dirty, rusted out, used up, that we're losers, that we're nobodies? Yeah. People say we're the mistake by the lake. Yeah, funny. They say we're not New York, we're not LA, we're not Chicago, we're not important. Those people say we're dead. Those people are here. When you're here, you see what everyone else here sees. You see life's not about where we've been, but where we're going. And you see that sometimes you have to fall down before you can stand tall. Yeah, you have to look hard. Newspapers and naysayers can drown it out, but nothing can stop it. Here, it's all about the Renaissance. They're gonna build it whether you come or not. And if you bring whatever you can right now, you're on the ground floor. This isn't the Rust Belt, this is blank slate. So now, who do people say we are? Well, that's up to you. Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, I know several of you have um, on mission trips. Um, Cleveland, let me tell you a little bit about Cleveland, what's going on. Mention that video, there's a renaissance going on in Cleveland. Cleveland, last fall in October 2016, was named the hottest city in America by Forbes magazine. Forbes also called it the next Brooklyn. Now, in downtown Cleveland, the occupancy rate for apartments and condos is 99%. You're on a waiting list for six months. There used to be uh, all these empty buildings. The last empty building in Cleveland, which was the Cleveland Athletic Club, is now being turned into an apartment complex. They're building a 55-story apartment building right beside the queue where the Cavs play. And, and, and downtown Cleveland is just booming for the 
area. For the first time in 50 years, there's a full grocery store in downtown Cleveland because the population is growing in downtown Cleveland. But there is a renaissance downtown with Cleveland. It's a safe place to be. It's the second largest theater district uh, in the United States behind Broadway in New York. Most people don't know that. Uh, our largest employer is Cleveland Clinic, about 45,000 people. Uh, University Circle has had like $8 billion of investment in the past 10 years, and it is a hopping, unbelievable place. So there are these areas of Cleveland that are just unbelievable that, that millennials are going to. A place where I could buy a house uh, five years ago for $20,000, that ha same house now cost $150,000. And so the millennials are moving in, uh, gentrification is taking place, but the poor of the city is still, they're still being marginalized in our city. The gospel, there's not a resurgence and a renaissance of the gospel in our city. Uh, all of these great things are happening in our city. The Republican National Convention last year brought attention to our city. The Cavs brought attention to our city. But our city is dying without Jesus Christ. There are people who will die today in Cleveland who do not know Jesus, just like here in Alcoa. That our city is in need of a church planting movement. And I cannot do that by myself. Our planters cannot do that. Uh, between 1997 and 2007, we planted one successful church plant, just one church plant in 10 years. Since 2007 to now 2017, we have planted 47 churches. We have a, our first Arabic church plant, our first Chinese-speaking church plant, our first Puerto Rican church plant. We have two deaf church plants that if you were to attend, there would be an interpreter for the hearing. We have two cowboy churches we have 14 African-American church plants, and they meet anywhere from a YMCA to a theater that, you can look this up, in 1959, uh, the landmark case for pornography that went to the Supreme Court happened in Cleveland because uh, an owner of a theater in Cleveland played a French pornographic film. He got arrested. He took it to the Supreme Court. It was the landmark case for pornography, and today one of our church plants owns that theater. And 550 people are meeting there this morning. That's what God is doing. We have church planners today who are working two, three jobs and trying to plant a church. We need churches like yours to start to pray for a church planner. And I've asked Matt. He said, how can we help? One of the ways that you can help is in your church, you can do this in a Sunday school class, you can do it in WMU or whatever, is go to PrayForPlanters.com. And you can choose a church planter to start praying for. One of the ways that you can help our church plant, it's lonely. I'm telling you, I planted a church. I planted two churches. It is the most, and I've pastored. And it is the most loneliest job in the world is to plant a church planter. Because most of the time, a church planter starts with him and his wife and the dog. Uh, put up, I think, I think is the map the next one. I can't remember what the next slide is. I have two different presentations. Uh, keep going. I keep going. Uh, keep going. Oh, I think I gave you the wrong presentation. I have one for churches and one for, for pastors. Keep going. Yep, I gave the wrong one. All right. Is there not a map there? There's, uh, there's not many maps. We have a, a map of churches, uh, places in Cleveland that we need to plant churches. About... Uh, we need to plant 100 more churches in Cleveland. And so here's how you guys can help and, and, and be a part of what we're doing. Is our church planters, uh, I hope you all understand how the Lottie Moon Christmas offering works and the cooperative program and Annie Armstrong. Our, our international missionaries are fully funded, and it has to be that way. They give a, a full salary, housing, car, because they're in a country, they need that. Our church planters are not funded that way. My church planters, they make $900 a month, and that is it. There is no insurance, there's no housing, that is it. They have $900 a month to plant a church, and that is it. Now, here, let me tell you how you can help. Your church can pray for that church planter. And then you can start sending cards to that church planter on his birthday or his wife's birthday or their anniversary, and a card, and maybe you put in a Visa card or a, a, you know, a TGI Fridays card so that they can go out to dinner. Uh, so, because the, they they have a hard time affording to do these things. This is this is how church planting works in North America. 
Unfortunately, our guys do not get full salaries. They do not get full benefits. They are having to work jobs. I'm having to get churches to come alongside of them to help them and, and bring mission teams to help them do the work. This is, just, this is the hard work of missionary work. And it's here in North America, it's here in the United States that this happens. And so your church can begin to, to select a church planner and begin to pray for him or your Sunday school and send him cards and, and, and help him. I know as a church planner, I began to get a card from a little lady in Kenner, Louisiana every month. Her name is Vera Angelis. I didn't know who she was. I just know this little lady somewhere in Louisiana was making a handmade, homemade card, and she would put these little sparkly star things, and when you open it up, they all fall out everywhere. You know, you got to clean it all up. And, and, and every month, I would get this card. Me and my wife would get a card from this lady, and she would just say, I'm praying for you, and, and she would cut things out of God post or whatever, and she'd paste it inside this card. And, and so, you know, a while, I just kind of like, okay, but every month, it began, I began to continue to get these cards. And I began to really feel the prayers of this lady. And I began to appreciate, look forward to that card. Every month, I look forward to that card. Well, in the position that I am now, I, I deal with a lot of church, our church planners. And I just was curious one day, and I said, hey, guys, do any of you guys get cards from people around the country on your birthdays, or you get cards during the month somebody's sending you? And they all said... Yes, we get, I get a card from this lady named Vera. I said, you're kidding me. And so last fall, I began to investigate Vera. And I found out that Vera is 84 years old. She's a member of a church in Kenner, Louisiana. I tracked her down through Facebook. She is not on Facebook. But just the post that I put, the pastor's wife said, she comes to our church. And so I, we began to do some investigation. I had the North American Mission Board contact her. They wrote an article about her, that online, an online article last month. Come to find out, Vera sends 300 cards every month to church planners all around our country. And she lives off Social Security. Our planners' wives, we have about 40 of them, decided they're going to start sending Vera cards every month with a book of stamps. And help her send out. You see how simple it is to help out a church planner? And, and now our church planners, we are looking forward to the cards that we get from Vera. And we, I may never see this little lady this side of heaven. But I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to recognize her. And I'm going to hug her neck. And I'm going to thank her for the encouragement she gave me and to the church planners that I work with. Your church can make a difference in a church planner's life. You can, you can send a mission team up to help them do vacation Bible school. You can send a mission team up to help them do a sports camp, to prayer walk, to do door-to-door -door surveys. I, I don't know, Matt, if you've ever done this, and maybe I'm just putting you on the spot. That's okay, you know, because I get to leave here. You'll be here, you know, tomorrow. Okay, so <laughs> uh, here's what I would challenge your church to do. I would challenge your church to go into this community and do a door-to-door -door survey and find out who lives here. And ask some questions of the people who live around this church. Maybe you guys have done that. I don't know. Prayer walk first. Set a week or two weeks and all you do is you just go and you walk around the streets of this community and you pray for every house and the people who live there. And then you'll come back and you'll go to door to door. Take kids with you because nobody shuts the door on kids' face. And you just ask some simple questions. What do you think the greatest need in this community is? Have you ever asked that question in this community? What's the greatest need? You see, we can look at demographic reports all day long until we're blue in the face. But until we start engaging people, we will not know what their needs are. What's the greatest need in this community? And they're going to tell you. And then you can ask them, what's the greatest problem in the world? And they're going to tell you that too. But you're just trying to get them to talk to you. And then you just, I get, you ask them some questions like, you know, why don't, here's one, why don't you attend, why, why, why do you think people today do not attend church? They're going to tell you why they don't attend church. Uh, the First Baptist of Alcoa, that's the church of money. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any idea. I'm just, that's a perception of most, most First Baptist churches wherever you go. First Baptist church, that's a white church. I'm not going to go there. You're going to find out why they don't go to church. And if we are a sent people, and God has called us to go, and I'm preaching to, the, to you now. 
If God is calling First Baptist Church, I'll call it a go, to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, and you're not doing it, why not? Why aren't you going? God is ascending God, but we become a sitting people. And it's time we stand and we go. And we don't rely just on missionaries or pastors. Now I look at myself and I say, I'm a missionary, that God has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Dear friend, this is not, I love your sermon. Are you going to, this is not our home. We have become too comfortable in this world. Many of us say in this room, I hate to say it, you love this world more than you love Jesus. And it cannot be that way. We used to like to think that our nation was a Christian nation. We're a nation of 300 and roughly 20 million people. And 265 to 275 million of the people in this country do not know Jesus Christ. We're not a Christian nation, dear friend. We're not. Our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, in China, in Russia, in South America, who suffer for the name of Jesus, who are persecuted for the gospel's sake, would tell you and tell me today that, oh, we appreciate the persecution because without it, we'll become complacent. And yet well, here we are without persecution and we sit. God is sending you. I pray that God will send you to Cleveland to help my church planners, to help my guys reach a city that's only 92%, that's 92% lost, 8% evangelical. A city where they think more highly of King James than they do of King Jesus. I pray that you would come. I'm putting out the Macedonian call to you today, that you would come and be a part of what God is doing in Cleveland through church planting. And maybe some of you are college age, maybe some of you are high school age, you feel a tug at your heart that God is calling you into missions. I have a place for you in Cleveland. Some of you, I hope and pray that God would radically get a hold of your heart and you may be married with children and you, in your heart and your wife, God starts dealing with both of you and you come together and say, let's move to Cleveland and find a job and work in a church with a church plant in Cleveland. God, God is doing that kind of, he's doing amazing things around the world today. I appreciate what David Platt, our president of the International Mission Board is doing we cannot afford anymore to send just thousands of missionaries on the mission field. He is calling for college students to study abroad and be a part of a church plant somewhere on, the, on the international soil and help a church plant. He's calling on professionals to get jobs and work internationally and, and make a living, but be a part of a church plant internationally. He's calling for senior adults who like to travel, to travel to an international country and go for several months at a time and be a part of a church plant and help there. We're doing the same thing with the North American Mission Board. Maybe God is calling you to a new occupation, to a new city, and you don't know why. You feel this restlessness in your soul that God is doing something. Maybe it's that God's calling you to come to Cleveland. He called Abram when Abram was 75 years old. He can call you today if you're 75 years old. It is not too late, dear friend. It is not too late to answer God's call. God is wanting to send you. The answer, the, the problem is, or the, the quandary here, is will you be like Isaiah and say, Here am I, Lord, send me, or will you be a pickle? And you're just going to set, soak, and sour. It's your choice. We can't make you do anything. I'm just here to appeal to you through the gospel's sake to do that. I'm going to close with a verse in Matthew chapter 9 that I pray every day. It's really, it's in Luke 10 too, but in, in, in Matthew chapter 9, the scripture says that Jesus went throughout all the villages and the cities teaching in their synagogues preaching the kingdom of the good news, healing every disease and infirmity, 
amongst the people. And when he saw the people, he had compassion on them because they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, earnestly, diligently, that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into his harvest. Every day at 10.02 in the morning, my phone goes off, my watch buzzes, and reminds me, because Luke 10.2, to pray Luke 10.2, pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send workers into the harvest. For the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I pray every day, God, send me church planters who will love this city. Send me, God, partner churches who will love my church planters and invest in them. Church, you have a great history. But the best time of this church's life could be before you. And it's through missions. It's through being missionary. Thank you for letting me share with you this morning. And I pray that God would call you into missions. I pray that there would be an unsettling, that you will not be able to sleep at night. I pray that you just cannot run from God. And if you want more information about Cleveland, hey, I'll be around here. You can t talk to Matt or Matt. Uh, Matt, you, you've been to Cleveland. Uh, so these guys can, can share more with you. Let me pray with you and pray for you. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to Matt. Let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, this day. God, thank you for this church. God, just pray for First Baptist Alcoa. That God, they would just grasp that they have been sent into this community. God, that they have been sent into this, Lord, uh, place, this, this city, Alcoa. Or, Lord, they may live in Maryville or Knoxville, wherever they are, wherever they do. God, if they work at the plant or they work at a school or they have a small business, God, wherever they are, God, that they would understand and grasp and live that they are missionaries for you. I pray, God, that you would use this church, God, to be a church that will support a church planter through prayers and uh, God coming to Cleveland and maybe even financially help a church planter. God, whatever, God, you lead them to do, Lord, may it be done for the glory of Jesus and, Lord, for the gospel that people would come to know you, Lord, in our city. And I pray, Lord, for them as they reach this city. God, open doors for them. May you use Matt, the staff, the leaders, the lay people of this church to transform Alcoa, God, into a church that is sending missionaries to every corner of this planet. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.